Hello and welcome to The Take with Sophie Ridge, live at nine here in the heart of Westminster. And what a week to start our new politics show. We've had grovelling apologies from the Prime Minister, blistering attacks from the opposition, a call for him to resign from his own side, and tomorrow MPs will vote on if there should be an investigation into whether Boris Johnson misled the House over Partygate. PMQs was particularly angry this afternoon, so there's plenty for us to get stuck into as we bring you takes from all sides over the next 60 minutes. He must be out of his tiny mind, Mr Speaker. <laughs> The state of it, the party of Peel and Churchill reduced to shouting and screaming in defence of this lawbreaker. Well, there were particularly furious exchanges like that. We'll bring you the best of the dust-ups at PMQs. But the Prime Minister was on very different form yesterday when sorry seemed to be the easiest word. Heartily sorry for my mistake. I, I apologise uh, profusely. I apologise once again. I repeat my uh, my apologies, my contrition. Uh, but I want to say on the... There's been a lot, an awful lot of that. So we'll try and work out if all that apologising has got the PM off the party gate hook. And who better to ask than the most important people, you at home, because we are going to be seeing what your viewers' panel make of it all. And here they all are. We'll be hearing lots more from them as the programme goes on. And we'll also have some top guests for you too, including the former Housing Secretary Robert Jenrick, Labour's Shadow Leveling Up Secretary Lisa Nandy will be in the studio with us. Plus, we'll be talking to Craig Whitaker, who is one of a handful of Conservative MPs who has publicly called on Boris Johnson to resign. That's all coming up on The Take. Hello and thank you for joining us for our very first show. We're going to be live here in Westminster every Wednesday night. The plan is to take the political temperature midweek and it's certainly pretty high today with interviews, analysis and of course most importantly the thoughts of our very own viewers panel as well. So let's crack straight on shall we because it's been a week dominated by the return of Partygate with MPs able to tackle the Prime Minister over his fine for the very first time. And at PMQs today, the leaders' exchanges were furious with some real anger on show. I take this opportunity on the first available sitting day to repeat my wholehearted apology to the House. What a joke. Yeah. Even now, as the latest mealy-mouthed apology stumbles out of one side of his mouth, a new set of deflections and distortions pour from the other. I regret to say that we have a Prime Minister who broke the laws that he told the country they had to follow. I no longer think he is worthy of the great office that he holds. Why does the Prime Minister think everybody else's actions have consequences Absolutely. except his own? I, think, I feel he's in some kind of Doctor Who time warp. We had this, uh, we had this conversation yesterday, uh, Mr Speaker. These are strange answers from a man who yesterday claimed to be making a humble apology. Yeah. <laughs> Does the Prime Minister actually accept that he broke the law? Uh, Prime yes, Mr Speaker, I've been absolutely clear that I, I humbly accept what the, uh, what the police have, uh, have said. The state of it, the party of Peel and Churchill reduced to shouting and screaming in defence of this lawbreaker. He's a Corbyn Easter in a smart Islington suit. That's the truth. No plan to speak to, to fix the economy. Prime Minister, sit down. I want to hear what you've got to say, but I can't hear when you're talking that way. How can the Prime Minister claim to be a patriot when he deliberately attacks and degrades the institutions of our great country? He must be out of his tiny mind, Mr Speaker. <laughs> We get on with the job while they flip-flop around like beach flounders on the beach, Mr Speaker. Well, you can see it has been a pretty punchy week. Boris Johnson is going to be hoping he's done enough to keep his own MPs on side. But what about the public? Well, let's try and find out, uh, shall we? Because it's time now to speak to our regular panel of viewers. Here they are. Good evening, everyone. Give me a bit of a wave. 
If you can hear me, lots of waves, that's what we like to see now. We've got people from across the UK and also across the political spectrum. So it's really interesting to find out uh, their take uh, on Partygate, which is where we're going to start. Let's go to Chloe Forrest first, uh, shall we? Now, uh, Chloe, you're a Conservative and you live in a small village in Cumbria. You're also a nurse, so you obviously worked during the pandemic. What's your take on Partygate? How seriously are you taking it? I think it's, um, you know, how many times does one person need to apologise for something? He's acknowledged that he did wrong. He's got a fixed penalty notice. He's paid that notice. And I think that there's more pressing things to be getting on with. I think the question that they're asking of Boris is, has he misled Parliament? And actually, we don't know if he has or not. We don't know what he was thinking at the time. And it's something that the police report and then the Sue Gray report will acknowledge and we can find out after that and until then I think we need to get on with more pressing matters um, and then concentrate on it later down the line because this is going to carry on for weeks okay maybe months we can't keep going up. okay Chloe there we should move on uh, according to Chloe let's talk to uh, Lisa Goddard now shall we I think you may have a slightly different view on this uh, Lisa you're a Labour supporter uh, yourself uh, do you think it's time to move yes. on uh, I don't think it's time to move on. I think it's time for Boris to move on. Uh, I think his behaviour and attitude has been shameful. Keir Starmer there talked about institutions and uh, I work in education where we have to promote fundamental British values. The rule of law is a fundamental British values and he's broken that and uh, he needs to go. He needs to go, according to uh, Lisa. Right, let's get our next uh, view, shall we? Lots of nodding heads I can see there. Uh, let's talk to Roy Royer. Do you agree? Is it time for Boris Johnson to resign over Partygate? No, definitely not. I, uh, I tend to agree if Chloe, you know, we, we have to put ourselves in his shoes at the time. In fact, everybody's shoes at the time. Everybody was fumbling around with exactly what the rules meant. And I think a lot of the interpretation is exactly that. It's, it's subjective. Um, those that will hate Boris will always hate Boris. So this could fester for years and take everybody's minds off more fundamental things that, that need to be concerned about. OK, there you go. Uh, Roy, the Conservative voter, believing that uh, actually uh, there are more important things for us to be uh, talking about. How about you, Hannah Underwood? Let's bring in Hannah Underwood now, shall we? Uh, I think you'd probably describe yourself as a Labour supporter, although you did vote Lib Dem tactically last time round, didn't you? Uh, what do you think uh, about Partygate? Is it damaged Boris Johnson or should we be moving on? It has damaged Boris Johnson and his credibility. I think if you set the laws, he's a prime minister, he's the first amongst equals, he leads our country and should set an example. And this birthday party is just one example of where he's broken the rules. There are others. And I think if you expect everybody else, when they attended funerals, not to hug each other, not to socialise, if you expect everybody else to follow those rules, he's admitted he's broken the law, it's not even rules, he's broken the law, then he should resign because it's the honourable thing to do and he should set an example by doing so. OK, right, we're going to get one more uh, take uh, from you guys and then I'm going to ask you to get your pieces of paper out because I'm going to ask you to write down a word, so just hold that thought. But finally, uh, we're going to go to Paul Blom, a Conservative a voter from London. Give me your view, Paul. Is it time to get rid of Boris Johnson? Well, I think Partygate is important. Um, I don't think it's the right time at the moment. I think we still need to await uh, the results of the police investigation and the Sue Gray report. Um, I think, you know, I think it's a sense of British fairness. We need to see the outcome of all the inquiries that are going on. But uh, I, I do think that Boris, I don't think Boris will be leading the Conservative Party into the next election. I don't think he'll go of his own free will, but I suspect that... Um, the, the, the Tory the Tory MPs will um, ask for him to move on and will elect a new leader at some point. OK, uh, interesting stuff. Right, now I have asked you all to uh, have a piece of paper handy. Uh, so I'm going to just try something out. What I want you to do is to write down the word that comes into your mind when I say Boris Johnson. What word comes into your mind when I say Boris Johnson? I can see you all having a bit of think. You are on live TV here, so please uh, bear that in mind. But if everyone just write down what, what word comes into your mind when you think of Boris Johnson. And when you're ready, hold it up in front of your camera and hopefully we should be able to read the screen. 
OK, let's have a look. Interesting. Some a little bit easier than others to read. I can see unrepentant uh, there. Uh, that is uh, what Lisa Goddard thinks. A pragmatic Chloe Forrest, effective, says Roy Royer, ebullient, hubrist, raving, unworthy, and dismissive. Wow, there's some excellent word choices there. That says quite a lot, doesn't it? Thank you so much. Really interesting uh, to, do, to get your takes. We're going to hear more from you uh, and your reaction in particular to PMQs uh, as the programme uh, goes on. Now, the next hurdle uh, for the Prime Minister is a vote tomorrow. It's called by Labour on whether or not he should be investigated over allegations of misleading the House over Partygate. Now, the government is in for a fight tomorrow. They don't want the probe uh, at all. But number 10 is still worried about dissent on their own backbenchers, perhaps from Conservative MPs like Craig Whitaker, who we can speak to now. Thank you very much for being on the programme, very first programme uh, for us. So we're delighted to have you, Mr Whitaker. Should Boris Johnson resign? Well, that's what I've said this week, uh, and that was on the back of his fixed-term penalty notices. I've always said that we would wait to see what the outcome was, uh, and uh, if uh, the Prime Minister who made the laws had broken the laws, then in my view he should resign. So the government, I guess, will argue that it's effectively a sideshow, he's apologised, there are more important things to be getting on with, uh, with Ukraine and the cost of living. You clearly don't have that perspective. Why do you think... Uh, that the Prime Minister needs to go? Well, I, I, I want the Prime Minister to take responsibility for his actions. Uh, you know, uh, my constituents, like lots of others around the UK, went through some real hardships. And, look, you know, the physical act of what he's been fined for is kind of immaterial uh, because, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it is... Excuse the expression, but it's, it's a birthday cake at the end of the day. But... It's the mere fact that he's broken the rules that he expected everybody else to, to uh, adhere to. And, you know, lots of people, lots of families, my own family, saw people die, uh, couldn't see loved ones in hospital, uh, couldn't be with them when they died, and then, in, some, in many cases, couldn't even go to the funeral. So when people have made huge sacrifices like that, it is important that the Prime Minister of our country, who is the lawmaker, sticks to the rules. You're talking there about, you know, the personal stories that people felt during lockdown with your own family, sort of bereavement. You're the MP for Calder Valley, relatively, you know, marginal seat. It was held by Labour in the past. Are you concerned that if Boris Johnson leads the Conservatives into the next election, you might lose it over this? No, I, I don't think it'll come to that. I mean, the general election's two years away, and as we know, a week is a very long time in politics. So, uh, you know, it's not about an eye on the general election for me. It's about actually, you know, this government is doing some great things, some huge things, huge investment in places like the Calder Valley, levelling up agenda, infrastructure spend, uh, lots and lots of things going on. But unfortunately, as I said yesterday, this is like a very damp or very wet blanket that is smothering that story. Uh, and we need to move on from it. So tomorrow, Labour's going to be tabling this motion uh, to ask MPs to vote on whether or not Boris Johnson should be investigated by the Privileges uh, Committee about allegations that he misled the House by saying that no rules were broken over Partygate. How are you going to be voting? Well, well let, let, uh, my understanding, whilst being on air somewhere else, is that the, uh, the government have put forward a, an amendment to that. Uh, I, I physically haven't seen the whole amendment yet, so I can't comment on, on that. But my further understanding from speaking to other people is that I suspect what will happen is the whole House will unite behind one of those versions tomorrow and it will probably go through. So, at some point, because the amendment, it appears, is, is kicking it slightly down the road to perhaps after the Sue Gray report is published, you believe that whatever happens with the amendment or not, at some point, the Prime Minister is going to end up being investigated by the Privileges Committee? Well, well, I mean, look, you know, the Prime Minister has said, consistently said, and, and this is very different to the, to the law-breaking, you know, the, there's two very separate issues here. Uh, the, there's a law-breaking, which is where I've called for him to resign. Uh, and then there's this issue where there are people saying that he has uh, shown contempt to the House of Commons. That's what this process is about tomorrow. Um, and as I said to the Prime Minister personally yesterday, is that, look, you know, you've been saying all along that you didn't knowingly break the 
rules, and at face value I accept that because I have to, um, but if that's the case, then what's the issue with self-referral to the Privileges Committee anyway? So, you know, let, let, let's just get it out in the open. Uh, and I suspect that's what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, and just finally, so you, uh, of course, think that Boris Johnson effectively should stand down. You believe that as a lawmaker he can't break the laws. That would leave a vacancy. I'm guessing you don't think that Rishi Sunak should fill that vacancy as he has already uh, accepted a fine as well. Uh, 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 you, you, you may or may not know, but as well as calling for the Prime Minister to resign, I also call for the Chancellor to resign too, because he's part of that decision-making process, just like I did when Dominic Cummings went up to Barnard Castle uh, a year or so ago. Um, it is that simple for me. Um, uh, look, uh, we're, we're nowhere near that point yet of, of looking for a new leader, and we're, you know, it's definitely clear that the Prime Minister doesn't appear to be resigning. So let's deal with that when Minute we get there. You, you say we're not at the point of choosing for a new leader, but you are, with respect, calling for the Prime Minister to resign, which would lead a vacancy. So who would you think should fill it? Uh, well, uh, we'll have to wait and see who puts the names forward at that point, uh, if we get to that point and when we get to that point. Uh, but we're definitely not at that point. I mean, I think there's 10 MPs on the Conservative benches that have come out publicly and said the Prime Minister should uh, resign, even to get a vote of confidence, or no confidence, I should say, in the Prime Minister, um, we, we have to have 54. Uh, so we're a, it's a numbers game. We're a long way from that process. And then, of course, the Prime Minister will probably uh, win that vote anyway. So, uh, you know, uh, let's wait and see what's going to happen, Sophie. Br briefly, how many other MPs do you think are in your position, Conservative MPs, uh, with these deep misgivings, if you like, about Boris Johnson continuing in this job? Are we talking a handful? Are we talking dozens? How many are we talking? Well, there's ten so far come out publicly, so I, I dare say there are more. Uh, but like a lot of people, they are waiting to see what's going to happen. They'll wait to see what's going to happen, what the direction from the party is tomorrow. I suspect, like I said earlier on, uh, there will be some agreement with the opposition parties about what we actually do tomorrow. Okay. Um, uh, uh, let's wait and see. OK, thank you very much, Craig Whitaker. Uh, there. Let's bring in, shall we, our deputy uh, political editor, uh, Sam Coates, who is on the show with us with some analysis. Um, I'm interested to know what your take is, Sam. How many MPs do you think are in the similar position uh, to Craig Whitaker, effectively thinking that Boris Johnson needs to go? Well, we know that there are about 14 Tory MPs that have said on the record they're not sure that Boris Johnson should fight next election. Two or three times that say he should definitely stay. But the vast number... So if hundreds of Tory MPs haven't really been clear either way, they're kind of sitting it out, trying to wait to see whether or not there are more fines, whether or not Sue Gray, the top official, is going to look at all of this after the police investigation's out of the way, uh, whether she's going to be damning. And only then, so some weeks away, will we get some sense of resolution from Conservatives. We're looking at mid-May, maybe even the start of June, before Boris Johnson's future is decided. That's why we're a long way away from a sort of moment uh, where uh, the Conservative Party determines whether or not Boris Johnson continues to be their leader. And Sam, just explain to us what is the latest uh, with this uh, motion tabled by Labour about potentially referring the Prime Minister to the Privileges Committee over misleading or not Parliament? Big day tomorrow. Two different visions. Labour want there to be an investigation by a cross-party group of MPs into whether or not Boris Johnson lied. The Tories in the last hour have put down their suggestion which is that there shouldn't. Instead, there should be a vote at some point in the future over whether to have such a probe. In other words, they want to kick the can down the road. I'd expect a big fight tomorrow, but we'll be looking for the number of Tory rebels, Tories who don't sign up to the Conservative number 10 plan. Not sure it's going to be that large number, because I say most Tories at this stage sitting on their hands, but Labour very keen to ram this issue home as hard as they can this week to get as much political capital out of it before the local elections. Really interesting stuff. We'll be talking to you uh, later in the programme, Sam, with some polling uh, as well. But now it is time for Labour's take. They're keen, of course, to keep the pressure up on number 10 uh, over Partygate. We're joined now uh, by the Shadow Levelling Up Secretary of Labour's Lisa Nandy. Thank you very much for being here. Great to have you on the first show. Um, just talk us through, uh, firstly, I mean, you obviously feel the Prime Minister needs to resign at the Partygate, but I was quite interested hearing from some of our viewers who 
some of them, not all obviously, believe that actually it's time to move on, this is a sideshow, there are bigger things to worry about. Well, look, I think it is time to move on, it's time to, to deal with the cost of living crisis, it's time to deal with the fact that there are families and businesses that are struggling to stay afloat and no help as yet on offer from government. But we can't function as a country if we have a Prime Minister who doesn't tell the truth. We can't function, as we saw during Covid, unless we're all in it together. And that's why this matters. It's not a question of what happened two years ago in a closed room in Downing Street. It's a question about whether the Prime Minister of this country, who makes the rules, feels that he's above the rules, that the rules only apply to some of us, not all of us, and whether, in fact, we are all in it together. And I think what we've heard over the last few days suggests very strongly that this is a Prime Minister that has real contempt for those rules, who feels they don't apply to people like him. And that's why you've heard MPs like Craig Whitaker. He and I elected 12 years ago at the same time as new MPs. We've been in opposing division lobbies, I think, on every issue since. But we speak with one voice on this. It's just simply not good enough and he's you, got to go. You're going to need more MPs like Craig Whitaker, though, aren't you? And more Conservative MPs to back this motion uh, from Labour tomorrow. Just explain what it is you're trying to do uh, with this motion. Well, we want the Privileges Committee to investigate whether the Prime Minister misled the House. You'll remember that not very long ago, the Prime Minister came to Parliament and said there were no parties. It then transpired that there were parties. He then said he wasn't aware that there had been parties um, and so on and so on. He only apologised in the end when he was caught. He's not sorry that he broke the rules, he's sorry that he was caught. I think Although, a lot yeah, of that's Tory MPs... subjection, isn't it? That is your own subjective analysis of that. Boris Johnson's uh, view is that, look, he, he, in good faith, didn't believe rules were broken. Boris Johnson said no rules were broken. Now he says that he didn't believe rules were broken. But I think you've got to listen to people like Craig Whitaker because he speaks for a lot more Tory MPs than you're hearing from on shows like yours. I was in the House of Commons today going through the division lobbies. How many there is a lot then? of disquiet. It depends how many Tory MPs can find the same level of backbone that Craig and a handful of others have done. But I think the fact that the government is now conceding that they're probably not going to win this vote without concessions tomorrow shows that this is a Prime Minister in deep, deep trouble. Every Tory MP will be looking at their inboxes tonight, reading the same stories that I am, of people who lost loved ones, who didn't say goodbye. And when the Prime Minister and his allies say, look, this was only a few minutes a few years ago, people would have given anything to have a few minutes with people to say goodbye when they lost loved ones a few years ago. It really matters, and it matters that we uphold decency and integrity in this country. Uh, we, on the programme, have been talking quite a lot about Prime Minister's questions. We heard some of the uh, exchanges from earlier. They're kind of very angry, uh, you know, exchanges between Kastama and Boris Johnson. I guess my question is, is there an issue for Labour that it feels like much of what we're hearing from the opposition at the minute is anger towards the government, criticism of the government, and not that much about a positive vision for the country. I mean, Keir Starmer's two years into the leadership now. Does he not need to start spelling out a little bit more about an alternative vision if you guys are serious about taking over? Yeah, I mean, what's the biggest crisis facing people in this country right now? It's the fact that inflation is at a 30-year high and most people watching your show will be struggling with energy bills. Do you hear any of those questions at Prime Minister's questions? So, but, we, you know, we've, we've put forward a proposal to the government which most people back. You had the big bosses of the big energy companies in Parliament this week saying, look, we can't deal, deal with this alone. One company, one sector can't deal with it. We need government intervention. We've said that we could have a windfall tax on the profits of big energy companies. We could knock hundreds of pounds off people's energy bills by doing it and put money back in people's pockets. But if you're talking there about, is about an energy security, this if you're is not thinking about the, the, the monumental mental uh, crisis that we face in terms of the cost of living, in terms of energy, windfall tax on oil companies. I mean, don't you need to be a bit more ambitious than that? Don't you think you need to talk about some really difficult decisions uh, on energy security? Yeah, look, we're, we're far more ambitious than that. I mean, I was the Shadow Foreign Secretary who came on your show and said Labour got it wrong on Russia, not least because we had to get very tough, not just about the interference of Russian money and politics, in British politics, but also about our own energy security. We shouldn't be reliant on countries like Russia for energy Even security. Even if it means bigger bills for people in the UK. But it, that's precisely the point. The reason that we've got sky-high bills for people here in the UK is because we're taking these knee-jerk reactions in response to major events rather than foreseeing those events. We've degraded our gas storage capability over the last decade. I was the Shadow Energy Secretary as warning 
not to do that. We slashed solar tariffs that supported the, the growing solar industry. We took the axe to onshore wind a few years ago under a Tory leadership. This has gone on for a very long time and we've been pushing the government over the last couple of years to take seriously the fact that if you want to cut people's energy bills, you've actually got to invest in home insulation, which the government is currently cutting. Of course you've got to take action in the long term, but this is a crisis right now and the government should also be taking action in the short term. Just finally, there's a critical by-election coming up in Wakefield. Big test yeah. for Labour for the government uh, as well. There's a lot of rumours about Ed Balls coming back <laughs> yeah. and standing as a Labour candidate in Wakefield. Any truth in it? Well, look, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't get involved in candidate selection. That's a matter for the members of Wakefield CLP. I mean, I've watched Ed Balls' growing infamy and career with huge interest, as many people have over the last few years. Whether he wants to give up his dancing shoes and return to politics, you know, that's a question for the members of Wakefield Would CLP. Would you like to see him return to frontline politics? I've got huge respect for him. You know, I, I worked with him when I was working with child refugees and he was one of the people in government who was very instrumental in making sure that we got decent treatment for those kids. So I've got a lot of time for Ed Bulls, but it's up to the members in Wakefield. The point is surely that we've just had this appalling incident with the existing Tory MP who's now done the right thing and stood down. We've now got to get a Labour MP re-elected so that those people in Wakefield finally have an MP that they can be proud of. OK, Lisa Nandy, uh, thank you very much for being on the programme today. Thank, thank you, Lisa Nandy there. You're watching The Take. We're live in Westminster. Up next, we're going to be hearing our question of the week from PMQs, where we give the backbencher a chance to respond to the Prime Minister.
bama dale komase ligay bi yoku yoku te bu bari am nañ ko ci Hello, welcome back live to Westminster. This is The Take. Now, if you're a politics geek like me, PMQs is one of the political highlights of the week, and it was certainly a fiery session today. So here's what our political correspondent, Joe Pike, made of it. This is PMQs Unwrapped. Boris Johnson is desperate to move on from the Partygate row. Yesterday, MPs were debating it. Tomorrow, they'll be voting on it. And today, Labour and the SNP piled on that pressure. One of Keir Starmer's advisers told me their strategy is to punch the bruise. A merely mouthed apology when the cameras roll, a vicious attack on those who tell the truth as soon as the cameras are off. Why does the Prime Minister think everybody else's actions have consequences Absolutely. except his own? Would the Prime Minister like to take this opportunity to apologise for slandering the Archbishop and the Church of England? Labour's accusation here. Boris Johnson may have said sorry in public yesterday, but privately in a meeting of Tory MPs, he was less effusive and reportedly criticised the Archbishop of Canterbury for questioning the government's Rwanda immigration policy. The PM hit back. I feel he's in some kind of Doctor Who time warp. We had this, uh, we had this conversation yesterday. He must be out of his tiny mind. He would have elected a Putin apologist. That's what he wanted to do. We get on with the job while they flip-flop around. Keir Starmer's questions today were shorter and a little sharper than usual. If we analyse his language, words like apology, cameras, claimed, resigned, broke, all pop up. You can see he is zoning in on themes of character and honesty. If we do the same with Boris Johnson, who at points did seem a little tetchy today, he is pivoting, as usual, to what his government is doing for the British people. Elsewhere, the PM did admit law-breaking. Does the Prime Minister actually accept that he broke the law? Uh, Prime Minister. Yes, Mr Speaker, I've been absolutely clear that I, I humbly accept what the, uh, what the police have, uh, have said. When an SNP MP suggested the PM was a liar... They just want this Pinocchio Prime Minister to pack his bags and go. Yeah. It was a Commons clerk who flagged it to the Speaker. And we also heard a new Tory attack line. I think he's a Corbyn Easter in an Islington suit. He's a Corbyn Easter in a smart Islington suit. I think you'll find Mr Corbyn doesn't have the whip. It is perhaps worth remembering Boris Johnson was a long-term resident of Islington and Sir Keir lives in Camden. This whole Partygate row has now been going on for more than four months. Is there anyone who hasn't made up their mind? Maybe not, but by keeping the story in the headlines, opposition parties are trying to ensure it's at the forefront of voters' minds for the local elections in 15 days' time. That was uh, Joe Pike uh, on all the action in the Commons this afternoon. So let's find out what our viewers' panel uh, made of it all. Uh, so first of all, uh, bearing in mind, of course, that this is eight people, uh, they're politically representative, but it doesn't reflect, of course, what everyone necessarily believes. But just let's do a show of hands first, shall we? If you think that Boris Johnson won today's Prime Minister's questions, put your hand up now. If you think Boris Johnson came out on top, put your hand up now. Oh, I've got one person. OK, if you think that Keir Starmer came out on top, raise your hand now. One person. Two people. So what about, what about the rest of you then, the other five? Do you think that no one came out on top? Were you just a bit disappointed with PMQs if you didn't, if you thought they were both as bad as each other? A draw. <laughs> both as bad as each other, raise up your hand. Okay, that's where, that's where public opinion is now. Right, let's go to Roz uh, now, shall we? Uh, let's talk to uh, Roz McMullen, a uh, Labour voter from York, uh, to get your uh, perspective on PMQs. What did you make of today's uh, Pretty fiery session, wasn't it, Ros? Well, I think Keir Starmer was right to go on the issue of character because fundamentally this is what it's about. It's about the fact that the Prime Minister tells lies. He's an accomplished liar. He's been sacked from two previous jobs for lying and he is totally unfit for public office. You know, he told us, he told the House of Commons that he was angered 
uh, and distressed, what was it, shocked and angered, I think was the words he said about the Allegra Stratton video that was released. Um, when clearly, you know, all the time, he knew that he had broken his own laws. And don't forget that this fixed penalty notice is actually probably for the least of the law breaking that he has taken part in. It's only the first. He constantly deflects. He constantly tries to get people to put the blame on others. He's currently trying to hide behind the distress of the Ukrainian people. Uh, it, it, it is sickening. The man okay. is unfit for public office. And I think Keir Starmer was absolutely right to go on the issue of character because okay. this is the problem. We Ros, have a prime minister we cannot trust. Ros, not trusting the prime minister, uh, their pretty strong views uh, there. Let's talk to Samit Thacker, uh, shall we? Um, you uh, quite like... Uh, Keir Starmer's Labour Party, don't you? Uh, but how do you think Keir Starmer performed at this today's Prime Minister's questions? You didn't raise your hand there, so I'm, I'm interested to know your thoughts. Yeah, I thought um, Labour were quite weak um, in today's questions. Uh, I felt like they gave Boris Johnson an easy way out. Uh, I think the temperature was raised up for them to really strike and, you know, uh, have some really punchy questions. But the very first question, for example, was on Allegra Stratton Jones, like they're asking the prime minister, well, why did she resign? That almost as trying to second guess that he will lead them on to the doing something wrong and the integrity issue. But actually, the the the, the real question at, at hand um, was, um, you you keep saying get on with the job, and every time someone raises this issue, you say get on with the job. But does get on with the job mean you comply with the law? and the rules that you have formulated. Okay. Are you going to do that in a compliant manner? OK. Right, well, let's talk to uh, Tim, shall we? Tim Wiltshire, a swing voter. Uh, what did you make of today's Prime Minister's Questions session? To be honest, I think it's disappointing. Um, everybody seems to be pursuing a minor issue um, with Partygate, and there are far more pressing matters when one looks at the Ukraine and energy and the economy and things like that. And I suppose, you know, not having a particular political bias, one feels that um, perhaps the opposition are clutching at straws. Um, and Craig Smith was saying that the government is doing a good job and doing good things. And, and maybe that's why the opposition are clutching at these straws uh, and going for Partygate. Um, and one thing I'd say on Partygate that, uh, you know, has yet to be in my... Uh, maybe it has been established somewhere, but I haven't seen it established... Um, within the law, there is clearly an issue of intention. Now, did Boris Johnson actually intend to break the law or did he accidentally break the law or recklessly break the law? And I think that, you know, perhaps when the Gray report comes out and we have more detail, then we can comment. But until we actually know if he just happened to be in a room um, and he therefore broke the law, that's completely different to actually intending to break the law. Interesting stuff. Uh, right, let's talk to Roy, shall we? Let's bring you back in uh, at this point, shall we? Uh, Roy, uh, Roy, a Conservative voter, you, you're living in a, a in Kent at the minute, I think, aren't you, Roy? Um, what did you make of today's Prime Minister's Questions uh, session? You've been quite sympathetic to Boris Johnson uh, so far, it feels. Um, do you think he came out well at PMQs? Because I noticed you didn't think that he particularly won this session, did you? No, I think you... I, I, I tend to agree with some of the other contributors. I, I think he was allowed to get away with it. He dodged a few bullets um, that, that he could have been, he could have been hit a lot harder. And um, he had a, a reasonably easy ride. And I almost feel that's because um, Keir Starmer and Labour feel that they're running out of steam. I mean, really, will I say this in private? And I'm surprised I'm saying it in public, but I actually agreed with Lisa, Lisa and Andy that we, we should be concentrating on um, security of our power supply, security of our, our food supply and just get away from this, basically. I'm getting so bored with it now. Let's just move on. OK, and a quick last word, uh, shall we, uh, with Hannah. Uh, you, again, you know, you tend to support Keir Starmer on the programme so far, but you didn't put your hand up thinking he won. Was he a bit disappointing for you today? I think he didn't land a killer blow. I think he had some very good questions. But I think with Prime Minister questions, it's not always the best way to hold the Prime Minister to account in some ways, because they're quite limited. Yesterday, I thought Keir Starmer was excellent against Boris Johnson, who looked very 
ashamed. I think he came back more prepared. He knew what the questions would be. And I, I think he, he, I said he was a bullion. I think he was. He just was very confident. He just thought it doesn't stick. I can just carry on, brave it out and and see what happens. So. Okay, really interesting stuff. Just a snapshot, of course, but um, always fascinating to talk to you guys. And I'm looking forward to speaking to some of you next week as well. Thank you for giving up your time. Now, it's our regular chance to speak to a backbencher as we pick our PMQ of the week. It's the one that really caught our eye during the session earlier. And today, let's have a listen. It's this one. My constituent, Aidan Aslin, has served in the Ukrainian armed forces for four years. Last week, he was captured by the Russian army in Mariupol. Yesterday, a video emerged of my constituent handcuffed, <coughs> physically injured, and being interviewed under duress for propaganda purposes. Would my right honourable friend agree with me that this is a flagrant breach of the Geneva Convention, that treating any prisoner of war in this manner is illegal, and that the interviewer, Graham Phillips, is in danger of prosecution for war crimes, and that any online platform, such as YouTube, which hosts propaganda videos of this kind should take them down immediately. Very distressing story, of course. Many of us will be familiar uh, with that uh, case. Now, of course, usually the questioner doesn't get the chance to respond to the Prime Minister's answer, but we're going to try and put that right, so every week let the MP uh, do that. Now, the question uh, that we just heard was from Robert Jenrick, uh, formerly in the Cabinet, of course, still MP for Newark, and he joins us now. What did you make of the Prime Minister's reply to your question? Well, I was pleased with it because he was obviously knowledgeable about the case and had been properly briefed on it and was able to say that my constituent was not, as Vladimir Putin has said, a mercenary or a spy, but a British citizen who joined the Ukrainian army some time ago has fought bravely and is now at the hands of the Russians and being treated in this appalling way. There isn't a great deal that the British government can do we hope that in time, Aidan will be freed in, as part of a prisoner uh, exchange, which is happening at the moment between the Russians and the Ukrainians. But the main thing that I want to do is to ensure that in the meantime, he's treated appropriately. Mm. And it's frankly disgusting that he is being paraded on Russian TV, interviewed by Putin's puppets like this so-called journalist, Graham Phillips, so, and that social media firms are hosting these grotesque videos. So that's, I guess, where you think the PM could act. It felt to me, looking at his answer, you know, uh, echoing your sentiments, urging the Russian state to treat your constituency humanely, a lot of warm words, but he didn't exactly promise that much action, did he? Well, the one area I think the British government could act, as you say, is to ensure that the social media platforms take down Russian disinformation and propaganda videos like this. I mean, the last time I checked, YouTube still have this video up. It's been viewed hundreds of thousands of times. And I say it, it is the most grotesque form of propaganda where a British citizen is sat there bruised, handcuffed and being interrogated. This sort of thing shouldn't be happening in the first place, but reputable social media companies should be having nothing to do with it. Um Talking about domestic politics uh, now, earlier in the programme we spoke to your colleague, uh, the Conservative MP, Craig Whitaker. He said that he thinks Boris Johnson needs to step down uh, because if you make the law, you can't then break the law. He's right, isn't he? I, I take a different view to Craig. I mean, he's a valued friend and colleague of mine. But I, I do think that Boris Johnson is the right person to be leading the country. I can't see at a time when there are such big issues like a European war, like an emerging and escalating economic crisis, that we would want to get into the territory of a leadership election and contemplating changing to, leader. That doesn't seem to me to be in the so national I've, I've heard this argument before that, you know, we're in a time of war, so we can't change the leader. I mean, we aren't at war, are we? Obviously, Ukraine is at war. Um, but also, there's precedent for changing prime minister and leader, even when we are at war. We changed leader during World War One, twice during World War Two. Well, I think those are, with respect, quite poor comparisons. The times that prime ministers have resigned in the past have generally been because there's been a catastrophic failure of the government's central policy. But some like people Neville would Chamberlain, say that like Anthony a, Eden. Some people in would some say there's like been, Theresa May. Some people would say that there's been a catastrophic uh, failure of public confidence in the prime minister because, as we heard from our panellists, quite a lot of them think that he's lied. 
Well, your panel was actually quite split from the conversation yeah. I heard, and that there were certainly people on the panel who felt that this has been a sorry episode, that it's something that should clearly not have happened. However, there are very important issues facing the country, and it sounded to me as if some of your panellists, at least, mm -hmm. wanted us to move on and concentrate on those big issues. That's how I feel. I think that politics now needs to be focusing on the cost of living, above all, and in the war in Ukraine as well. These are issues of huge importance, and we should be careful about being diverted. That's not to say that we should trivialise what's happened. I think the Prime Minister is embarrassed, mortified by what's happened. He's apologised to Parliament. I think that was the right thing to do. But I do now think, as a member of Parliament, I'm not a member of the government, that these issues that the public really need to be front and centre now are the cost of living, are Ukraine, are those issues of huge national and international importance. You say you think the Prime Minister's mortified. Is that from the public statements he's made or have you heard anything from him privately on that? Yeah, I've spoken to him privately and, of course, I've listened to the various public statements that he's made. Did you ask him for reassurances then? I have asked him for reassurances. There is no way he would want this to have happened. He feels extremely embarrassed that it has. I don't think that he would have knowingly breached the rules. He didn't think that he was breaking the rules at the so time. So he didn't understand the, the rules that he created? Well, the, the incident that we know most about, the one that he's received the fixed penalty notice for, you do have to remember that Downing Street themselves briefed out information about that in the days immediately following, almost two years ago. So at the time, they didn't think that they were in breach of the rules. That's not to justify it, because I think that it was a mistake and shouldn't have happened. But it does give you a sense that the Prime Minister was not setting out to break his own rules. This was, I think, okay. an honest mistake. What I think is most important now is that he does apologise and that we focus on the big issues. Quickly, um, Labour, of course, tabling a motion uh, tomorrow to say that the Privileges Committee should investigate uh, whether or not the Prime Minister misled the House. Um, would you support that investigation? Well, the first thing is that the government is actually tabling mm -hmm. an amendment to that, which means that there will be an opportunity to vote on this as a Member of Parliament once we're equipped with the final report by Sue Gray, and I think most importantly of all, the final verdict of the police as to whether any further fixed penalty notices are served. So I, I would urge colleagues to wait and to vote however they wish to, once they're equipped with the full facts. I do think there should be quite a high threshold before you uh, create one of these investigations. They're extremely rare. Very few of these have happened. I can't think of a precedent whilst I've been a member of parliament. And so we shouldn't do this for incidents which are relatively minor, which I think, in fairness, the one for which the Prime Minister has been served a fixed penalty notice is. It may be that when we're equipped with the full facts and the Sue Gray report, that we change our mind or I change my mind and there is actually a case to have a full investigation by the Privileges Committee. But it sounds to me as if the government has come up with a perfectly reasonable answer okay. at the moment, which is let's have that debate when we all know what the true facts are. OK, Robert Jenrick, thank you very much thank for being you. on the programme uh, today. You're watching The Take. We are live in Westminster. Up next, we are going to be doing some post-match analysis with our Deputy Political Editor. fantastically catchy tune and the words are lovely and they just express everybody's feelings for the Queen uh, in this amazing 70th anniversary year of her reign uh, and it's a, an outpouring of love and appreciation for a woman who's completely devoted her life to this country and there's so many different wonderful sounds in this <laughs> in this piece as you saw there we've got the London Community Gospel Choir the wonderful Rodney Earl Clark uh, we've also got uh, Maori singers and Hindu singers and a wonderful South African singer and all the instruments that go with those countries because it's meant to encompass the whole Commonwealth, this piece. And we're all saying the same thing. We thank you from our hearts. Uh, it's our way of saying thank you to the Queen for being who she is. It has just been so fantastic. And when I sat down to actually envision the project, I had a problem. 
Yeah. So how do we fit 70 years of rain in 96 years of a life into four minutes of song? How do we do it? So it, it's been a process. It's using the history. It's working with fantastic people such as Anton Vandermeer, a uh, fantastic co-lyricist, uh, and orchestration. It's just been a process that is of love. It's of respect. It's of marking what Her Majesty stands for and her life's work within the Commonwealth, starting with seven nations and now ending up with 54 in total. That's that's quite a job that she's undertaken for 70 years. What you didn't hear in that little segment there is the fantastic lyrics that have been written. And we actually describe the evolution of Her Majesty from an unblemished face to a maturing face. And visualizing that image through song really shows a progression of who the queen is and what she is as queen of not only this country but 15 in total. We're going through some very difficult times at the moment there's been there's so much sadness and disruption in the world but I think to be so joyous about our monarch is a wonderful antidote to all of that. Con eso ya podemos ir evaluando entonces cómo el cambio climático va a afectar estos ecosistemas y eso cómo afecta prácticamente toda la cadena. O sea, si afectamos a los productores primarios, que son las microalgas, vamos a ver afectado obviamente todo el resto de los organismos. I love my job because I get to do something that is contributing to a better future. Hello and welcome back to Westminster. This is The Take. We've had plenty of takes this evening, so time now for a bit of post-match uh, analysis. We are joined by our deputy political editor, uh, Sam Coates, who's here again. You've been listening to all the interviews uh, today, uh, Sam. Lots on party gates. Uh, you would have assumed that this would benefit the Labour Party. How comfortable do you think they are that so much of the kind of political oxygen, I guess, has been taken up by whether or not this man should resign at the party gate? Well, look, I was really struck listening to your chat there with Lisa Nandy because on the one hand, it's clear that Labour wants to lean in as far as possible to what is undoubtedly a political gift. But listening to her and talking to some of the people around Keir Starmer, there is a nervousness that this can go too far. They know that all some here, according to their focus groups, from senior Labour politicians is carping. So they're concerned about how they make that pivot from the attack of Partygate, for as much as that has worked, onto something a little bit more voter-friendly. Cost uh, of living, lots of people worried about that, aren't they? To bring people on board who perhaps are less bothered by that. And let's have a look at the polls, uh, shall we? This is the uh, latest Westminster voting intention. You can see Labour uh, in the lead. Uh, what do you make of this? So here at the moment, according to the last week's YouGov poll, uh, we essentially have a five-point lead uh, for the Labour Party. Now, that looks quite good. It's uh, certainly better than the party has been at points. But at one point, the Tory party was down on 28 points and Labour was up on 41 points. So they've actually, even though there's what would seem like a gift to many people for the Labour Party, they're not riding at their highest point that they have been. And if you look across all of the results back to the uh, general election in December 2019, when Tories won an overall majority, there have only been two periods with La uh, Labour in the lead. One here when lots of people felt that Boris Johnson was unlocking from the pandemic too fast. And here, more recently, where Boris Johnson's been beset by problems over Partygate. Now, you can see it's a pretty sustained lead, but I think the biggest thing that's going to affect Tory MPs when they choose whether or not to keep Boris Johnson as their Prime Minister is whether or not Labour look like they can sustain a lead that could cost the Tories the next general election. Boris Johnson is nothing to Tory MPs if he's not a winner. And if that magic is undermined, then so too is he. That's interesting. So in a way, what you're saying is that the loyalty to Boris Johnson uh, is predicated on him winning elections. Absolutely. And I think that's why the local elections are the unspoken test. Yes, the police, how many fines does he get? Yes, Sue Gray, but those local elections will be key. Uh, 
be really interesting. Thank you so much, uh, Sam, for uh, the uh, analysis. Well, that is it for the take, the very first show. We're going to be back next week and every week on Wednesday at 9 p.m. Thank you so much for joining me uh, for the first programme. It has been a lot of fun. Next up, it is Sky News at 10. Thanks for watching. See you next week.